As long as you stay yeah, in the podium, yeah. we'll have a microphone right here. Yeah, that'll capture the motion. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the only one that will be for the live stream, if you don't mind wearing a second one. That's fine, I can have a part of it. They can't grab our video, can't be grabbed from the. So, we do have audio for the mail box. So, is it backup? Yes, sir. He's going to wait on this one. He doesn't need this one because we'll just have both these. Okay. All right. Morning, everyone. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Senator Marco Rubio. I was born in Miami, son of uh, Cuban immigrants. He, his, he and his wife, Jeanette, live in West Miami with their four children. He was elected to the Florida House of Representatives in 1999. In 2005, became the Speaker of the House at age 34, which I know for you students seems ancient, but that's actually really young to be Speaker of a State House. Uh, in 2009, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, and in 2015, was a candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. Senator Rubio is a committed Catholic who, at a time when religion is often under attack in the public square, speaks courageously from a faith perspective, for which we are all very grateful to him. I have, as you know, the privilege of being the founding dean of this Bush School of Business, the Business School of the Catholic University of America. Catholic U is the church's university in the United States, so we are the church's business school in the United States. We were founded, as you know, committed to the idea that Catholic teaching about business and the economy holds the solution to many of the issues that plague this country. So it's an absolute delight to us to see in, in a leader like Senator Rubio somebody who is taking on these ideas and bringing them into the public square. So please join me in giving a warm Bush School welcome to Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You saw a little movement. There, so they wanted me to work three mics and use this one. It's like, you know, is this an FBI sting operation? I mean, I'm <laughs> Anyway, I, uh, so hopefully this one and this one will be enough, but I'm, I thank you for being here. I'm really, uh, I, I thank you for the opportunity to do this. I'm, I'm honored to be able to do it. You know, a few weeks ago, the Attorney General gave a speech uh, about religious liberty at Notre Dame, and the reaction, for anyone who, who speaks in a forum like that and makes that link uh, between religion and public policy, is a real cautionary tale. Uh, you... Uh, we run the risk any time you do that of being accused of supporting a religious theocracy like something out of the Handmaid's Tale or whatever. So, but in order to avoid being canceled by an online mob, I, I decided to, to base my remarks today on a secular source of wisdom that I think is acceptable to all the people with the blue checks on Twitter and everyone in between. So my first choice was Kanye West. <laughs> And we started working on it, but then he came out with an album called Jesus is King, so I couldn't use him as a secular source. So, so I had to go back to the drawing board. So what I settled on is the writings of a 19th century Italian. His name was Vincenzo Pecci, because I felt like who could possibly get triggered by a 19th century Italian? <laughs> so let me tell you what he wrote about 130 years ago. 
This is what he wrote. He wrote, the labor of the working class, the exercise of their skill, and the employment of their strength in the workshop of trade is indispensable. Justice demands that the interest of the working classes be carefully watched over by the administration so that, th so that they who contribute so largely to the community may themselves share in the benefits which they create. He went on, by the way, to write that the ultimate goal of any society should be to make better men or make men better by providing regular people the opportunity to attain the dignity, the dignity that comes with hard work, with ownership, and with raising a family. And according to him, he went on to write, and you read what else he wrote there, what makes this kind of society possible is the rights of both workers and businesses, but also their obligations to each other. For example, he wrote that businesses have a right to make a profit. And workers have a right to share in the benefit of the profits their work helped create. But businesses also have an obligation to reinvest some of those profits productively for the benefit of the workers and the society that made it possible. And workers, if they're able-bodied, have an obligation to work. Well, I guess now is a pretty good time. Some of you from your chuckles may have figured it out already, but it's a good time to do something that, as a Catholic, and I, I don't know, I think there's probably a few Catholics in here, so you'll know what I'm saying, uh, something that we're pretty familiar with, confession. Because Mr. Petchy wasn't some secular economist. In fact, his, his views were, were deeply rooted in his Christian faith. In fact, he was better known as Pope Leo XIII. Now, I want to ask the outraged police for forgiveness, for I have sinned because uh, I've once again mixed politics with religion. But in 1891, in the midst of an industrial revolution that was transformative and disruptive, and the rise of socialism was occurring at the same time, he wrote an encyclical titled Rerum Navarro. Is that right? My Latin. I just don't use it very often anymore. It's funny. People say, your parents are from Cuba. Don't you speak Latin? I don't know. <laughs> I speak Cuban. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he wrote this uh, encyclical at a time in which you had this disruptive changes going on in the Industrial Revolution. People were being displaced, and there was a growing appeal to socialism. And so I wanted to revisit what he wrote because it sounds a lot like the transformative and disruptive economic changes that we face today, and some of the same reactions that we're having today to that disruption. The economy that, that he described 130 years ago was the right response was one in which workers and businesses are not competitors fighting with each other for their limited share of limited resources. It's an economy in which, part, in which workers and employers are partners in an effort that ends up benefiting and both of them and, by, and as a byproduct strengthens the whole country. And I would say that this is the kind of economy that most Americans would want us to have. It also, by the way, describes the American economy during our nation's most prosperous and most secure moments. And, and yet, for some reason, we've drifted really far from that kind of economy. For example, we are now people that are quite enthusiastic and familiar about our rights. Every one of us knows our rights. Sometimes we're not nearly as familiar with or excited about our obligations. On the political right, where I come from, we've become defenders of the right of businesses to make a profit the right of shareholders to receive a return on their investment, and the obligation that people have to work. All of these things are true, but we have neglected the rights of workers to share in the benefits they create for their employer. And we've neglected the obligation of businesses to act also in the best interest of the workers and ultimately of the country that have made that success possible. The political left is an enthusiastic champion of everyone's right to free everything. And they never shy from reminding us of businesses' obligations to share with their workers and the government. But they rarely focus on our obligation to work and do not focus nearly enough on a business's right to make a profit. This, this false choice between these two extreme points of view, that's what we faced in this country for almost three decades. And in the face of an economy whose architecture has been rapidly and dramatically transformed, we have been left with an economy and a society that, frankly, no one seems happy with, certainly the society part. For example, even after three years of robust economic growth 
and that's what the last three years has brought us, robust GDP growth, we still have millions of people in America unable to find dignified work. And they feel forgotten, and they feel ignored, and they feel left behind. And the results of decades of this kind of negligence isn't just economic. It's extended into weakening our families and eroding communities. And it has fueled the rise of grievances in which today over 70% of Americans believe that their fellow Americans on the other side of politics aren't just wrong, aren't just misguided, aren't just crazy. They believe all the Americans on the other side of political debate are a threat to our country. And this is not social media's fault or any politician's fault. And this is why it has rendered us today a nation that appears incapable of identifying our common good and then working together to pursue it. Now, let me start by saying that I am an enormous supporter of free enterprise. Free enterprise made America the most prosperous nation in human history. But the prosperity that it created, it created profits for businesses. But it was, that prosperity wasn't just about making a profit. It was also about the creation, the availability, and the durability of dignified work for people. Our strength, America's strength, doesn't come from the size of our economy alone, but also from how that success went on to serve the broader national. For example, we never could have defeated Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan without both an advanced and profitable industrial base but also the willingness of that industrial base of those companies to participate in the war effort. And after the war ended, returning veterans would have never been able to find a job, buy a home, and go on to start a baby boom if we didn't have strong businesses creating dignified work there to hire them. That, by the way, was the America that my parents came to in 1956, the place where it was possible for people like them poorly educated immigrants to find dignified work, to buy a home, to raise a family, and to leave all four of their children better off than themselves. And this is why I've always told their story. It, it isn't because of what it says about me or an effort to connect people to immigrant roots. I always tell that story because it says a lot about America, why I believe America is so special and exceptional and worth fighting for. That's why, since the day I've entered public service, I've been an unabashed believer, both in American exceptionalism and in the American dream and its transformative power. But when I ran for president, I learned the hard way that there are many Americans today that don't share that type of optimism. I met the Americans who were anxious, even angry, at those they blamed for ignoring them, for disrespecting them, for leaving them behind. From cabinet makers in Georgia to power tool factory workers in Pennsylvania, these are the people whose lives were turned upside down when companies exercised their right to make a profit by taking their jobs to another country, but did so with little regard for the corresponding duty to invest in their own workers. In essence, without taking into account the people who were left behind without a job. These are People, by the way, who are angry because people tell them to go back to school and learn to code and leave your extended family and community that you've always been in and get a job in the new economy somewhere else. These are the millions of Americans that are the victims of an economic reordering which uh, Pope Benedict in Caritas and Verite described as the dominance of largely speculative financial flows detached from real production. Because when we started only focusing on the right of businesses to make a profit and we stopped recognizing that with that right comes a corresponding obligation for these businesses to reinvest in the country that made those profits possible, then large corporations can easily become nothing more than a financial vehicle. Financial vehicles for shareholders, managers, and banks to assert their claim over. It's how we wind up in much of our conventional wisdom with the belief that a right to return money to shareholders is a right above all others. It is a right, it shouldn't be illegal. There's nothing wrong or inherently immoral about returning uh, investments to, to shareholders and profits to shareholders. 
but it is not a right above all others. And the obligation to invest for the benefit of our workers and our country became an afterthought. And the economic numbers tell the tale in this regard. So over the last 40 years, the financial sector and their share of corporate profits increased from about 10 to nearly 30%. The share of those profits sent to shareholders increased by 300%, while investment of those profits back into the companies and their workers and their future dropped 20%. Last year, corporations on the S&P 500 spent over a trillion dollars buying back their own shares. To take them at their word, these are the largest corporations in the world who collectively said, we don't have anything to invest in. This is what it looks like when, as Pope Francis warned, finance overwhelms the real economy. Now, because economics and culture are strongly intertwined, the effect of all this has extended far beyond just economics. For example, family is the most basic and most important of all of our institutions. It's not just a cliche to say that. The family is the first school that a child will attend. It's the place where they learn how to become responsible, productive adults. And it's the building block of any society. A community, the word community doesn't just mean like the city or even the neighborhood that you live in. A church, a church like uh, any church that you would find in St. Louis Parish in Pinecrest, Florida, where I attend, that's a community. A place where the members of that community come together to do things, to give of time and treasure and talent, to advance some cause that they care about. So for example, we will in our parish, as they will in many across the country, and many other denominations, and many other organizations in the weeks to come, come to collect money and put together and deliver meals on Thanksgiving. That is a community. A community is the sports teams that my kids have played on, where the parents are just are the coach, the equipment manager, the head of logistics and, transformation, and, trans, and transportation, the fans, the PTA that organizes the school supply giveaway for the needy kids in that school, and that organizes the end of year gifts for the teachers. That's a community too. But what happens when an economy stops providing dignified work for millions of people? All these things fall apart. Families, community, it begins to erode. Families without dignified work begin to splinter. Children fall into poverty. When there's no dignified work, more families need Thanksgiving meal delivered. But there's now fewer families who have the money or the time to deliver them. When dignified work is gone, parents can't coach. And PTA struggled to form in the first place. By the way, I want to say that I believe men are hit especially hard by this because without dignified work, the core of, what, of being a man, which is providing for your family, it's ripped away from you. And the impact is corrosive and devastating. And the numbers bear witness to the devastation that follows. Today we witness a decline in marriage, in childbirth, in life expectancy, the most advanced country in the world, a decline in life expectancy, and what's up? Drug dependency, suicides, and other deaths of despair. By the way, the shockwaves of this economic implosion, of this disorder that we today have in our economy, go well beyond uh, the economy and well beyond family and community. It impacts the society at large. It's driving a bitter cultural, political, and generational grievance. So on the one hand, in this disordered economy, we have these pockets of urban and coastal prosperity. You think about it for a moment. New York. I like New York, but New York is the home of our finance and our media elites. You're on Wall Street, or you work for one of the big networks or TV stations, New York and the surrounding areas is home. Los Angeles is the home of our entertainment elites. That's where all the movies and television and a lot of the music is made. And of course, here in Washington is the home of our political and government elites. And in all three of these places, and places like it, there are millions, I mean, there are obviously people struggling like anywhere else, but there are millions of people, especially those at the top of organizations in charge of important things that are really benefiting from the new economy. Good for them. This is not about grievances towards them or envy, but they're really being successful and they're benefiting from all the things that come with that success. But they're isolated and often oblivious 
to the struggles of millions of Americans sandwiched in between these coastal pockets of prosperity. And making matters, I think, even worse, really driving this conflict, is that the prevalent social and cultural views in many of these elite pockets are very, very different from the cultural and, and social views of many of the same Americans sandwiched in between the pockets of prosperity who already feel forgotten and left behind. And that's how you see a result, for example, I think in media, in the entertainment industry, even in our politics, that incessantly mocks the traditional values of middle America as backwards, and from time to time, or quite often these days, even accuses some of these people of being racist, bigots, and haters. And then in addition to this geographic and, and, and economic divide, we face an increasingly bitter generational one. I, don't believe, I can't believe I'm about to say this because uh, it tells you how old I'm getting. But my four children, who are about, at least two of them are about the age of everyone sitting in here, do I look, I feel 49, I'm 48, but, um, but my four children, okay, so many of you, you're part of the most educated and the most ethnically diverse generation in our history. And you think about why that's something that we should be proud about. America is a nation that has always said it is proud of its diversity. And we've always pushed people to go to school and get an education. You are the most ethnically diverse and educated generation, perhaps in all of human history. Unfortunately, you're also about to become the first generation in American history that is going to enter adulthood worse off than your parents, and especially your grandparents, entered adulthood. We're talking about people that had to borrow money to pay for overpriced college degrees, not Catholic, obviously, but some other places. <laughs> There's a great deal here. <laughs> it is. I'm, I'm not joking. No, no but I, I'm serious. I mean, I, I got out of college and I owed $170,000 after going to undergrad and law school. The numbers are much larger now. So I'm just telling you how people, I don't need to tell you how you feel. I'm just telling you what I hear back from my children's generation that I interact with. Frankly, out of necessity, just to make sure I know what's going on and with them and with their lives. And they're going to have to borrow money or are borrowing money to go to school and get a degree. And many of them say, I know I'm going to graduate with a degree and it isn't even going to lead to a job. Or if it does, it's a job I could have had without the degree and without the loan. And they know that home ownership is nowhere in sight, not unless they move far away to some place where houses are a quarter of the price of what they are where I live and where many of you come from. And then they'll rent if they want to move out of home, but rent's going to be about 55 to 60% of whatever you're going to make. Eventually, they're going to buy homes or rent one. They're going to get married. They're going to start families and a career, but they're going to do it far later than any generation in American history. And they're angry. They're angry at a system that has, rigged, has been rigged against them and rigged against them by the very people who created every single one of these problems. People who enjoyed cheaper college when they went to school, and then when they got in charge, turned around and raised tuitions on everybody else. The people from an era long ago in ancient times, the 1980s, uh, where uh, there was this motto that had been adopted that greed is good. That was a motto in the 1980s from a movie called Wall Street, and people were celebrating greed is good. Then they caused a catastrophic financial crisis and left us with this disordered economy. The point is that this cultural, this geographic, this generational divide, these forces, it's forcing us to confront what is an ancient and enduring truth that is impossible for any country to be strong if the whole nation does not benefit from its strength. So, for example, Pericles said that when a man, this is a great quote, when a man is doing well for himself, but his country is falling apart, or when his country is falling to pieces, he goes to pieces with it. And then the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, he observed, quote, that which is not good for the beehive cannot be good for the bees. 
And in more modern times, in 1968, Senator Robert F. Kennedy observed that, quote, if we as Americans are bound together by a common concern for each other, then an urgent national priority is upon us. Because he said, quote, even if we act to erase material poverty, even if we erase material poverty, there is another great task. It is to confront the poverty of satisfaction, purpose, and dignity that afflicts us all. The point being in all of this is that it is impossible, no matter how much you grow your economy, no matter how much you advance in certain sectors, no matter how great things may be for many people, it is impossible to be a great and strong country if millions and millions of your people, large percentages of your people, feel locked out from and left behind. So the question then becomes, what do we do to reclaim the kind of country that we want America to be? I think obviously it begins with forming a national consensus, an agreement that our challenges it's not simply one of cyclical economic downturns or that the wrong party is in charge or our challenge is an economic order that is bad for our country, for our society, for our people. It's bad economically because it's leaving too many people behind. It's bad because it's inflicting tremendous damage on our families, our communities, and our society. So agreeing on the problem, as difficult as it may seem, is probably the easiest part of it. It's something that we should at least agree upon throughout the political spectrum, that there's something going on in this country and we are not happy about it. Deciding what government's role is in addressing that, that should be the core question, the central debate of our national politics moving forward. And I can tell you that in that debate, the old ideas and old ways will not do. The notion that left unguided, without any sort of policy involvement, the market will solve our problems, that is not going to restore a balance between the obligations and rights of the private sector and working Americans. Because it may lead to GDP growth and record profits. Nothing wrong with either one of those, they're both good. But economic growth and record profits alone will not lead to the creation of dignified work. By the way, that view of economics fails to recognize what St. John Paul did when he said that, quote, the obligation to earn one's bread by the sweat of one's brow also presumes the right to do so. A, so a society in which the, this right is systematically denied, in which economic policies do not allow workers to reach satisfactory levels of employment, cannot be justified, end quote. What he's basically saying is the obligation to tell people you have to go out and get a job depends, pre presupposes, the right for that job to exist in the first place and for it to be a dignified and productive one. Now, before anyone watching or listening freaks out and says, oh my gosh, what's happened is transformed into someone from the left, I will tell you that I think socialism, for as bad as all this is, I think socialism would be far worse. The idea that government can impose the balance between the obligations and the rights of the private sector and working Americans has never worked. I say this with the most respect, which is what people always say before they criticize someone. <laughs> but some of the proposals that are out there now in this presidential campaign are things that Europe has tried and abandoned. It didn't work. It won't work here. It's never worked. And we have millions of refugees who came here fleeing socialism who can be witnesses to that. Here's why. A government that guarantees you a basic income is also the government that controls where you work and how much you make. A government that promises you free health care, which is not free, is also one that controls who your doctor is and what care you receive and when you receive it. A government that promises everyone that college is going to be free or that schools are going to be free. Again, it's not free, but it also becomes a government that controls what school you have to go to and even what you're allowed to be taught. And a government that seeks to control all of our societal needs, in essence, to step into the role played by community churches and PTAs and school teams and other community groups. A government that does that also becomes a government that tells churches what they can preach and it tells community members how they can interact. So we don't need socialism and we don't need simply to say the market will take care of it by itself. What we need is to restore common good capitalism. What is common good capitalism? It's a system of free enterprise in which workers fulfill their obligation to work and they enjoy the benefits of their work and where businesses enjoy their right to make a profit 
and reinvest enough of those profits to create dignified work for their workers and for America. And our current government policies today get this wrong. We actually reward and incentivize certain business practices that promote economic growth, but it's growth that often solely benefits shareholders at the expense of new jobs and better pay. For example, our, our tax code is biased in favor of stock buybacks. Now, buybacks shouldn't be illegal. They're not inherently immoral, and buybacks shouldn't be used to force companies to adopt social or left of center policies that some want. But buybacks do not boost job creation. Buybacks do not boost worker pay. So why should they have a tax preference? Instead, the tax preference, if we're going to have them, tax preferences should be for use of corporate profits that further the common good. Tax preferences should be for activities, for example, that create new jobs or higher wages. And that's why we should make immediate expensing a permanent feature of our tax code. Giving a tax preference to a business when they reinvest their profits in a way that creates new jobs and higher paychecks, that's what we should be doing instead. Common good capitalism also means recognizing that the market may determine, may determine that outsourcing an industry, like for example manufacturing, is the most efficient use of capital. So the market may say, OK, this is the most efficient place for us to put our money because we can generate the same product at a lower cost. We make more profit and we can actually drop prices for consumers. The market says that's the most efficient use of capital. But yet that outcome could be contrary to our national interest. And the common good is threatened by the loss of these industries or that capacity. And that's how for two decades we've allowed competitors, like for example in China, to use subsidies and their own market protectionism to build up their capabilities in various key industries while at the same time destroying ours. I'll give you one example, rare earth minerals. These are vital to our national security. They are a critical component of specialized computers, of weapons systems, of virtually anything in the realm of higher technology. And by the way, Accessing these, mine, these rare earth minerals and mining them happens to also be a source of, of pretty stable and dignified work. Today, America, we've allowed it to become, and the world, almost completely dependent on China for rare earth minerals. And we've done nothing to further our ability to provide them for ourselves. Just think about that. The market said, let them do it. They can do it faster and cheaper. But we are now in a position where they decide to cut us off all this technology we invented is useless because we don't have the rare earth minerals to put it together. That's one of the reasons why I filed a bill, legislation, to create a national cooperative that guarantees that there's going to be investment in this sector. Because even though the market determined that its most efficient location is somewhere else, not being able to do it ourselves worked contrary to our national interests. I think there are many other emerging industries that we should take a similar approach to. When promoting the common good will require public, we're, we're promoting the common good will require public policies that drive investments in key industries. In those instances, because pure market principles and our national interests don't align. Aerospace, telecommunications, autonomous vehicles, energy, transportation, housing, these are just a few of the industries that America always has to be able to do, always has to retain some domestic capacity. Not just domestic capacity, but in some of them, I believe, global leadership. Now, look, the goal is not to recreate the economy of 1969. The goal is to retrofit past engines of productivity for the economy of this new century. It's one of the reasons why I'm trying to reform the Small Business Administration, so that it channels finance into small business manufacturers instead of lifeless, corpless conglomerates. A revamped SBA will also drive the success of innovative, high-growth small businesses in advanced manufacturing. In essence, using the power of a government agency to channel and promote industries that are, national that are in our national security and national interest. All that would spur innovation in the physical economy. It would ramp up federal funding for research and development. We will reinvigorate the legacy of business innovation that delivered America to the moon 50 years ago. Common good capitalism also means recognizing fundamental shifts in our culture and how these shifts are affecting Americans as people. So as an example, today, many parents in this country are struggling 
with the growing cost of raising children. And few can afford taking unpaid leave when a child is born. In fact, what's most ironic about it is that the more money you make, the likelier you are to have paid family leave. And the less money you make, the more you need it, and the less likely you are to have it. Now, the market, which again, I believe in, but the market does not account for the benefits to our country of parental engagement, especially in the early days of that child's life. But good, common good capitalism does. That's why I've worked to expand the federal per-child tax credit. And that's why I've proposed creating an option for paid parental leave that, by the way, doesn't raise taxes or grow the debt or place any mandates on businesses. Common good capitalism is about a vibrant and growing free market. But it is also about harnessing and channeling that growth to the benefit of our country, of our people and our society at large. Because after all, ask yourself this fundamental question. Does our country exist to serve the interests of the market? Or does the market exist to serve the interests of our nation and of our people? And I think the most impactful benefit the market can provide our people and our society and our nation at large is the creation and availability of dignified work. Because dignified work gives people the chance to give their time and talent and treasure to their churches, to our charities, to whatever community groups they're engaged in. Dignified work makes it easier to form and raise strong families living in those stable communities. And dignified work helps reinvigorate the institutions that bind us together as a people. And here's what I mean by that. When you live with, when you worship with, when you serve with, when you share a community with someone, you know that person as a whole person. You may not agree with their politics, but you have other things in common that bind you together as two human beings. But when those people, when all of your neighbors, when millions of other Americans are strangers, and the only thing you know about them is who they voted for, or who they're going to vote for, then it becomes a lot easier to hate them, to see them as the other to come to view them as a threat to America. In that same 1968, in a speech that I cited earlier from Senator Robert Kennedy, he decried the deep cultural sickness of that era. He said it was discouraging initiative, paralyzing will and action, and dividing Americans from one another by their age, their views, and by the color of their skin. That was 1968. Perhaps those words could also be spoken now. And as he did in 1968, we have to accept the indivisible tie that exists between culture and economics. So that once again, we can reclaim the motto that's on our national seal, e pluribus unum, that we Americans are out of many, one. Now let me just close by telling you that in the lead up to the speech, some have asked me why, what was my goal for it? That I trying to create some third way forward between the two prevalent schools of thought in our politics, the classic triangulation, or was I trying to define a post-Trump conservatism for the Republican Party? My goal is neither. My goal for the speech is also my goal for everything that I am trying to do and have tried to do in the Senate. And that goal is above all else, above all else frankly, to do whatever it takes to keep our country from coming apart. Whatever it takes so that this exceptional nation, America, continues and endures instead of having it end with us. You know, it strikes me that politics today is increasingly about total victory, about crushing the other side, total victory. But you wonder, what is the point of total victory over the other side if after you win, there's no country left for you to govern? So even how we resolve these problems that I've outlined today, I believe, won't just define our country in this, in this century. I think it's going to define the century itself. And I say that because for the first time in three decades, America is faced with a near-peer competitor on the global stage. China is undertaking a patient effort to reorient the global order to reflect their values and their interests and to do so at the expense of ours. 
The global order they want is one in which the key industries and the good jobs, the dignified jobs, are based in them in China or controlled by them. The global order they work towards is one in which the principles of freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, that they're replaced by what they like to call societal harmony. Ask the people of Hong Kong what societal harmony means. And a global order in which the right to elect your own leaders and to complain about your leaders is replaced by a totalitarian system that actually makes protesting criminal and imprisons minorities like what we see in the Xinjiang region. Therefore, an America in which no one is held back by their gender, by the color of their skin, by their ethnic origin, this is no longer just some high-minded principle that happens to be morally right as well. Making sure that no one is left behind has become a national imperative. Because in this competition with a near-peer adversary and competitor, that happens to have three times our population. We need all hands on deck. We can't afford to leave anyone behind. So let me close by saying this, what I've described today is a difficult challenge. But being America has always been difficult. For in the words of the late sociologist Robert Bella, the American tradition, the quote, transcendent goal of our politics renders sacred our obligation to carry out God's will on earth. This is a difficult goal, but it's been one that's been accepted before, by every generation before us. And you and I and every single one of us today benefits greatly because the Americans that were here before us accepted that challenge. Well, now the time has come to decide whether we, in this generation, will accept the challenge of our time. Now, hopefully the time has come where we will author the next chapter in the story of the nation that changed the world. We have before us, I believe, I remain enthusiastic and optimistic, that we have the opportunity to create a country in America that's even greater than it has ever been before. I believe we have the opportunity to make you and my children and that entire generation and the children you will have and they will have, we have the opportunity for them to become the freest and the most prosperous people who have ever walked on the face of the earth. And if we do that and we achieve these things, then once again America will have transformed the world. And the 21st century will also be known as the new American century. Thank you for the chance to talk to you about this. Remind me to work in some of those applause lines in the speech so I could put, finish this coffee before it got cold. <laughs> All right. The Senator will take some questions. I'll remind any of you who are guests on campus that the primary purpose of this speech is the education of our students, so please keep the questions focused on the topic of the Senator's speech. Any questions? Or the National Football League or the NCAA. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Spanish word for thank you. <laughs> you're, you're just a really great inspiration to all Cubans and Latin Americans, and just everything you've done for the community back home means a lot. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. You'll get your 20 bucks now. I feel like I promise. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I wanted to uh, ask how this common good capitalism of uh, apply in American cities in an urban context. I spoke a lot about flyover country and the heartland, mm -hmm. but where Republicans and conservatism has traditionally failed to be appealing or engaging in the time we've been in the Los Angeles versus New York. Yeah, actually, that's a great point and, 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 a, and a blind spot in our speech that we should address because it's one that I've, I've tried to be involved in as well. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I focus on the geographic uh, but, uh, divide between middle America and the coastal areas, um, but but the truth of the matter is, I can just tell you from experience living in Miami-Dade County, 
it, it is in many parts of the county that I come from, that I live in, you could have people living six blocks from each other that live on a different planet. On one, six blocks in one direction, there are people living in really expensive homes whose kids go to elite private schools. They're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to add a couple hundred points to their SAT or ACT. Um, they, uh, they get to do internships abroad and study abroad and all kinds of stuff because they can afford to do that. Six blocks away are equally smart kids, but they don't have thousands of dollars to add a couple hundred points to the SAT or ACT. And they don't get to do internships in the summer, they have to work. And they don't get to study abroad. Um, so, and then, when, then they apply to schools and it becomes a disadvantage. That's just one example. And the problem is that our history and all the evidence tells us that there are millions of incredibly talented human beings that are being left behind sometimes, by, and we need their talent because we're engaged in a global competition with a country that has three times as many people as we do. So we do have to address that as well. And, and, uh, and I, I would also point out that those are the, it is actually, those areas are even, face even greater impact sometimes in some of the areas I described, because if you're in a pocket of prosperity community, real estate prices go crazy. Right? People come in, that's where you see gentrification. All of a sudden, all this money's available. People move into some community that's been blighted or, over, or forgotten because they can buy up homes cheap. They can tear them down or rebuild them and create these communities and all of a sudden, but the people who live there are forced out and somewhere else. So it also increases housing prices um, and, and, and increases the burden on people in those communities. So uh, you raise a very good point and one that I think we need to do a better job of addressing and I will. Next week when I'm back here for the speech, no, I'm kidding, whenever I get to, uh, but I appreciate you raising that. Yes, sir. You want a mic? I have like six up here. It's great to have you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what do you think is going to be the future of manufacturing this country? Because the Tax, tax Cuts and Jobs Act has had mixed success in terms of bringing back manufacturing to America. You lost some industry, you well, gained some industry. And I come from uh, Hamilton, New Jersey, uh, Chris Pitts District. He worked closely on numerous bills. Uh, and Trenton used to, our state capital, used to be a place where you had like Pullman working towns. Like used to have, Man Trenton makes the world take sign. And so what do you think is going to be the future of manufacturing in America? How can we restore that dignity of work to the, to the worker? And can I get your signature? <laughs> Well, the first, actually, the first, second one is easier. I can, I'll do that right now. But on the, um, on, uh, man, so, is everything all right? Oh, he's bringing the thing up. All right. All right let me, while I answer the future of manufacturing, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, this is not my hat, right? I know. Okay. That's fine okay. with me. <laughs> The what? Blue check Why? Oh, because of the hat? Who cares about that? <laughs> I can't put it on. That's in my hair. This will be with Pence and White House. Alright, let me get the man. Alright. <laughs> Thank you very much. God bless. Did you get a job already? This guy's aggressive, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Put him to raise some money out there. Look, I, uh, the manufacturing question, is w which, uh, which is a great question for you to use as he worked towards getting the signatures of all these things and his picture in. Um, I admire your initiative. So the, I think that's a key question for two reasons. But one is we do need to be a country. that The jobs that manufacturing creates are good jobs. And we do have an opportunity to lead in certain fields. So as I've had an opportunity, for example, to go and see uh, in Florida some of the manufacturing that's occurring around the space program and aerospace and how that's spinning off. Now, it looks different than it used to 50, 100 years ago. It's not as many people, but the workers that are there are more productive, meaning their labor is worth more, and so they make a lot more than manufacturing used to make. So I do think there's just, by and large, we, we want to have a positive relationship with manufacturing in this country in the right sectors that we're both supporting but that the market conditions justify because the types of jobs and stability they create are the, are the kinds of durable jobs that communities can be anchored in. But the second point I would make is there are some industries in which manufacturing becomes a national imperative. So as an example, it may not be, it may be cheaper to do heavy machinery, to do shipbuilding, to do rail building, uh, to, to make uh, uh, batteries uh, for, for 
for, for cars. It may be telecommunication equipment. It may be cheaper to do that somewhere else, but we can't become a country that depends, on example, to Beijing for those key products. Because if they're the only ones who know how to make that, they have tremendous leverage over us. We have this already in pharmaceuticals. America is home to a lot of great innovations in pharmaceuticals, but the actual medicines are manufactured in China. And so imagine in a time of conflict, God forbid, where the people who make the stuff say, you know what, we're, we're going to stop making it for you. Imagine the leverage that would create. So there are some industries in which we have to have the manufacturing capability. You know, it, it strikes me that as we're looking at the expansion of 5G and telecommunications and all this that's going on with Huawei and some of the other companies, one of the central problems we have is the alternatives to Huawei are too expensive and they're not American. They're not, they're not competitive. And so we go to rural telecom providers and say you have to take out the Huawei equipment that you have in your network because it can be used as a backdoor to, to collect data on Americans. I'm in favor of doing that. But then they'll turn to you and say, okay, and who do we put in place instead? Because we don't have companies in the West that are able to do it, at least at a price that we can afford or that consumers are willing to pay for. That's a huge challenge. And it doesn't have a pure market answer. It has to become a national priority for us to retain, whether it's through a conglomerate of like-minded nations or here domestically, the capability in certain industries, a capability that may not be justified solely on market principles. Do we have time for one more? Um, I don't know, you pick, because I don't want to, they're, they're all potential voters. <laughs> That's why they don't let me grade anymore. I teach at Florida FIU, so everybody got an A. So, <laughs> You speak about the importance of capitalism in the governments and coming from Latin American roots um, in today's uh, world. You see many governments in Latin, in Latin America where capitalism is not, is not a, a, a practice and, and we barely see democracy. Venezuela, Nicaragua, and there's a lot of economical uncertainties and policies going around. And not just in Latin America, but globally. And I just want to know what's your view, you being a U.S. Senator of Florida, and in Florida there's a lot, a lot of uh, Latin American people in it. What's your view on all this government where you don't see democracy and, and they don't let uh, their citizens protest and peacefully? Yeah, well we have two trends that I think are true in, in the Western Hemisphere, but in other parts of the world there are two things to keep an eye on. The first is that people think democracies are just having an election. Number one, it, it is possible to stage an, an election as theater and yet it not be a valid election. So if I'm running for office, but the only people who could possibly beat me are all in jail or disqualified from the ballot, I control the press, um, I, I, I'm the only one allowed on television, and by the way, my friends are the ones that count the votes, that's not a real election. But there are plenty of people in the world who will say, oh, they had an election because we ascribe our attributes to theirs. So there's, there's a, we see that trend line in places like Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, most recently. There are other places that have celebrated elections. Look, I don't like the outcome as someone who knows that the incoming government may not have a positive relationship with the United States, but no one's arguing that the Argentine election is illegitimate. We may or may not like the result of it, but it was a real election. The one in Bolivia, they stopped counting the votes at 85% in because it wasn't going the right way and then they started recounting a day and a half later and all of a sudden the guy they wanted to win was up by 10 points. Yeah. Statistically, that's not even possible. So uh, that's not democracy. So we can't allow that to pass for democracy. The second thing we can't allow is for corporatism to be mixed up with capitalism. Capitalism at its core, especially common good capitalism, is a system, as I said, in which workers benefit and, and have the right to benefit from their labor and that labor is made available and businesses have a right to make a profit, but also understand they have an obligation to the country, the society, and the workers who made that profit possible. That's not what you see in a lot of parts of the world. Just because it's not socialist doesn't make it automatically capitalist. Because what ends up happening is that in many nations on earth, what you have is a stale economic order where the same people and the same companies dominate these industries for three generations because they're politically connected, because they uh, they're not, uh, they allow monopolies because they don't allow innovators to enter the public space and compete. And we, we have to be wary that that doesn't ever happen to us either. 
Just because a business is privately held, just because you have private businesses that does not in and of itself make you a capitalist or free enterprise society if those businesses' successes are tied to who they know and who has influence. Um, Russia has a free economy and they have private companies and they have very wealthy individuals. And that wealth is largely tied to whether Vladimir Putin likes you or not. And uh, that's not free enterprise, that's corporatism, it's cronyism. So I think those are two things that unfortunately have hurt other, many of these places. And um, obviously you see protests in places like Chile that I think are driven a lot less by the macro economy and a lot more by some of the grievances people have over the cost of living, et cetera. That's actually an advanced economy where people are protesting about things that you see being protested about in Europe or in the US, the increases in transportation fees and the like. So, but it's an interesting time to watch the hemisphere. There's a lot of good news and there's some real troubling spots as well. Take one more question. Okay. The last question. We have yes. a question up here. Who's got the mic? Okay, all right, there we go. <laughs> what do you think comes first? Uh, the rebuilding of the American family or the reintroduction of dignified work to society? Because I kind of find it hard to believe that just because we have the reintroduction of dignified work, it just magically the family is going to be rebuilt. Yeah, no, not about? magically. Absolutely not. My speech is about what public policies we can pursue. And I think public policies that put in place the creation or, or incentivize the creation of dignified work would go a long way towards creating one of the elements necessary for strong and stable families. Ultimately, you know, I'm speaking about public policy. There's no law in the world that can make people better parents. I can't pass a law that makes people care about their kids. I can't pass a law that makes someone be a good father or a good mother or a responsible father or mother or caretaker. That's on us as people. I mean, lost in all of this, uh, I hope, is not the notion that somehow if we make these things happen in government, everything will fall into place. There's still 99% of life is lived outside the halls of government. People woke up this morning, even here in Washington, and went about their lives not waiting for the government to tell them what to do. They, they went out today and volunteered at a charity somewhere, not because the government made them, but because they wanted to do something useful with their time. They went out and opened once again at 7 a.m. their business. Not because the government told them to, but because that's what they love to do. Uh, people went out, are gonna, this afternoon are gonna pick up their kids from school after working eight or 12 hours and come home and make them dinner and make sure they do their homework. Not because the government told them, but because that's what their parents did for them and what they believe parents and what parents need to be doing. So there is a lot, but, but, it, but it does tell you the importance of community and family. Because a lot of those lessons and a lot of those things come from the environment in which you grew up in and whether it reinforces those values. I always tell people, my, my dad uh, was not a dad that would sit you down and give you these long talks of tremendous wisdom, okay? That's not his style. I learned more from my dad by watching him than I ever did from hearing him. And what I mean by that is, my dad got up every day, went to work, provided for his family, and came home every night to his family, and early, you know, not, he didn't, disappear after work for six hours doing whatever. And that's how I learned, frankly, growing up, what it means to be a father and a husband. Because I saw, that's what it was modeled to me. And I think in the absence of that, uh, you start to have some problems. Not in every case and not all the time. But it's something we have to acknowledge. There's a lot, the vast majority of what's going to happen in our country will have nothing to do with public policy. But I'm in the public policy field, and there is a role for public policy to play, and I think dignified work helps. Because the reason why my dad was able to get up and go to work and provide for his family is because he lived in an economy in America that created that kind of work for him. And, and we need to be, create that opportunity for more people moving forward. Thank you very All much. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.